Chris Morris, you'll probably fault me on this, but um, the day shall come seems to me to be a more serious departure from Four Lions. Or are you going to tell me it's an exactly the same theme? No, it's not exactly the same theme, because I think Four Lions is about four people, five people, who are terrorists. Right. And this is about a group of people who definitely aren't. So this film sort of comes in under two questions, which is one, who is the biggest recruiter of terrorists in the USA? And two, what would you do if you were broke, about to lose your house, and someone offered you 100 grand? And that's really, the, the answer to the first question is, rather surprisingly, the biggest recruiter of terrorists in the States is the FBI. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the second one gives you the clue as to how our story works. Because the FBI have accidentally, it seems, developed a system which works rather well. And the system is, they make up a terrorist plot, they find someone to try and carry it out, and they arrest them for doing that. And then get the kudos for having fought the great war against terrorists. Well, they get, they, they get all sorts of things, really. I mean, it's quite complicated. But I guess the essential element of our story is that these people are not terrorists, but the government ends up putting them in jail. For very long if terms. they were. Yes, 25, 30 years. And there's a close to 100% conviction rate in these cases. And I wasn't looking for this. I wasn't aware of this. I mean, I think we all sort of have a vague idea that the FBI may, may be involved in setting people up. But then when you follow the story that I did and you see it close up, it, it's jaw-dropping. It's really shocking and uh, very, very hard to believe. Uh, and yet the <laughs> statistics, once you lay them out, are, are quite extraordinary. I mean, uh, we're talking about 100 incidents of the FBI doing this, 100 known incidents. More, and actually, more. Yes, I mean, I say it's based on 100 true stories. That's yeah. a sort of notional 100. It's in the right ballpark. It's more likely 300. But... 300 times uh, the, the FBI have managed to pin a crime on essentially innocent people who were just part of some casual grouping, who they trained to be terrorists and then arrested and jailed. Yes, if I may take the FBI's side for a second, it sort of works like this. You're freaked out by 9-11. You have to cover yourself because you're implicated in some of the sloppy procedures that led to 9-11. So you talk the threat up. You say there's a sleeper cell in every city, and then you go and find it. Now, you don't know what you're looking for. And classically in the FBI, you talk about other people. You other. You look at brown and black people because they are more likely, you think, to be a problem. And if somebody sticks their head up in one of those communities, then you surround them with false friends, informants, who will offer them money and friendship to try and lure them along a sort of carefully scripted program of self-incrimination, which results in that person going to jail. And you will say to the court as a prosecutor, is it better that this person goes to jail or that we let them go back out on the street? And the juries always say, better put them in jail. The incredible thing is that these four that you have developed within the film uh, are, are cast as Muslims, but they are, in fact, Haitian Catholics. Well, I mean, yes. I mean, and they've been jailed as Muslim terrorists. Yeah, I mean, in, the, in real life, what happened was that there was a story on British TV news about the, supposedly the biggest plot since 9-11 about an army planning to launch a full ground war on the US based in Miami. And it turned out, three years later, I bumped into somebody involved in the trial who said that ground war was actually seven construction workers who were going to ride into Chicago on horses. This was not a really serious terrorist plot. They had just been wound up by an FBI informant. They had no money. The informant was offering a lot of cash. And so they riffed a crazy scheme to try and get this guy out of money, to try and take money off this guy. So that true story and loads of others informed the story within the film, which, yes, these... In that case, in the Liberty City 7 case, which was the the guys with the horses, um, six out of seven of them were Haitian Catholics. So I wanted a belief system in this film that was essentially made up. It's a bit black separatist. It has sort of Islamic and it's basically Abrahamic in, in its sort of bold form, but also harks back to General Toussaint, the slave rebel. And so it would look to the FBI like this person might be a problem, even though they're basically about to be thrown out of their house and they haven't, they've got an army of four. Although there are moments of humour in the film, without a doubt, the fact is this is a very serious film. I mean, what it reveals is deeply serious. And I'm almost wondering whether what has happened is that you couldn't use comedy in the way you're used to using it, as in Four Lions and all your earlier work. Uh, 
you know, you had, in a way, to produce a relatively straight film. Well, I think the comedy is always used to a purpose. Actually, if you look at Four Lions, it's essentially the comedy takes you on board. It puts you on the bus with a suicide bomber cell. So I'm always wanting to use comedy for a purpose. And I think in this film, there are lots of jokes. There are jokes at the expense of the farmer's eccentricities, and there are jokes at the expense of the FBI's machinations. Mm -hmm. And in the end, you're going to, you cannot, I mean, in the end of Four Lions, after all, people blow themselves up. Mm. At the end of this film, you have to follow it through to the consequences, the end of the story. And I don't really see the point of comedy unless there's something underpinning it. I mean, what are you doing? You know, are you doing some sort of, some kind of exotic display for the court to be patted on the head by the court? Or are you trying to change something? Well, as a journalist, having watched it, obviously my immediate reaction was to go and look up the figures, try and see what else I could find. And it is incredible that this has happened on such a scale. And you begin to look at American justice and say, how has so revered a system as, as it is in America itself come up with an incapacity to spot the charade that's being put before them? I just think there's no will to examine it. I mean, I think that once George Bush said, you're either for us or against us, there was a kind of division in American society between us and them, which had always been there, but it was somehow legitimized by the government. And the FBI acted on that same impulse. So the people they're investigating, they will not investigate white extremists. They still place eco-terrorists above right-wing white extremists because they just have an innate reluctance to stare the truth in the face. And they are very good at putting different communities, minority communities, under suspicion. Counterterrorism is an international operation. One wonders what other nations' counterterrorists have made of what's been going on in America, because they must look across and think, by God, they've got an awful lot of Islamic terror going in America, and perhaps we should look to our own laurels, and is there a danger it could happen here? Well, it couldn't happen in quite the same way just because of the way the law works, but there is an impulse always to mop up a problem. And if you are the orthodoxy, if you are the government, then you are, I mean, look at the way the Prevent mm. Programme works. Time and again, we're seeing mm. things which look benign, some sort of social media program designed to uh, encourage young Muslims to behave in a decent mm. way. And then you suddenly find that it's the engine of that is the Prevent Programme. There's all sorts of different ways of trying to assume that the other community is wrong and different and needs fixing, and then we will go in and fix it. But everyone does it differently. Is there a danger that the state of the world has overtaken Chris Morris's chance or opportunity or capacity even to, uh, to make comedy out of it? I mean, you know, we have got Donald Trump. We have got other versions. <laughs> I think that Donald Trump arguably starts with something like this. If you think of that George Bush statement, for us or against us, you legitimize a divide in society right there. Now, Donald Trump comes in 16 years later and exploits that divide. It's not the only thing. There's all sorts of other kind of destabilizers involved. But I think that once you polarize society that way, and it sort of happened with us after 9-11, that there was this kind of sudden, suddenly you've got a new other. And it seems to me that the thing to ridicule is that tendency because we are not that different. But isn't Trump half the time many steps ahead of you? Ahead doing, of me? <laughs> ahead of you. <laughs> ahead of you in the sense that uh, he's doing things even you might not have dreamt an American president could do. But it's not, it's not about the, the failure of your imagination to get to a point. It's what he's doing. And I think that, for example, if you look at Trump, suddenly the FBI were momentarily the good guys because they might bring him down. No, they're never good guys. And, but his, his technique fooled everyone into sort of a moment's mistake. Oh, suddenly the FBI are the good No, I mean, it's like with Nixon. The FBI instigated the Watergate inquiry. It didn't make them the good guys then. They were up to their necks in COINTEL Pro. So Trump's move is to confuse people, yes, but you've got to stick to what's actually happening. And I think that, yeah, you need to take notes pretty fast right now, but I don't think he's escaped ridicule. I mean. He is self-ridiculing, but you're always going to be able to ridicule someone like that. The problem is that I think we've got used to a kind of satire which essentially placates the court. You do a nice dissection of the way things are in the orthodox elite, and lo and behold, you get 
slapped on the back by the orthodox elite who say, jolly good, can you do us another one? That's not what it's about. So in a way, these times should bring on something with a bit more clout. Your trade has always been to make fun of us. I mean, <laughs> I am your sitting victim. Uh, and uh, I, I'm intrigued to know what you think our industry has done to respond to the way the world has changed since you were doing Brass Eye, for example. That's a long time ago. I, know. I think that time is, is, is essentially different in that th I think the news was coming to the end of taking itself seriously at that point. There was something changing, and in a way, it was just begging to be parodied in the way that we did because it was overstating its importance. And then I think quite quickly the news started not to take itself seriously and sort of started behaving like a desperate school teacher trying to get the class on side because it sensed that people might move away and that the time of saying this is the news, this is what's happening might be on the ebb. And I think that it's a different time now. I mean, the... the a different you know, time well, how? Well, how well, does it, it manifest? Well, because, it's because there isn't a single voice uh, people get their information from all over the place, and so suddenly news is now in a slight state of what, what can be unique about us, fact-checking maybe, something like that, but it's a smaller prospectus than they originally had, which was, this is what's happening. And I think it was that sort of voice that attracted us to doing a parody of that. But, you know, things move on, so you're gonna, you've got to keep your eye on the ball, and I'm not sure the ball is there anymore. And, and in a way... So our have... day is done. We might as well pack no, it no, in. No, no, no. I think we all have to keep... In fact, everyone... I think the important thing now is that people have to use the tools of journalism. But mm. in the proliferation of knowledge, people have to use trusted sources, and they have to cross-check things. That's the only defence against fake news. You've used comedy to expose something very dastardly. <laughs> in, in, well... In, yes. You know, the day shall come is unquestionably does reveal a very nasty development that actually the FBI invents all its, uh, or a lot of its terror cases. Yeah, there have uh, been in some order real to look ones. good. Well, obviously, yeah. there have been some good ones, but there are enough false ones uh, to be discreditable. Um, what do you do next? What do I do next? Yeah. Well, I just keep my eyes and ears open. I mean, I don't know. There's, you know, I could go backwards in time, could go forwards. I'm looking at the coup in Iran from 1953. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's a long, that's a sort of, a, I have an abiding interest in that, but I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I may just put a lot of effort into a tweet. You're very interested in the overthrow of uh, the Iranian president of that time. It's a great story. It's a great story that combines British skullduggery and then American kind of uh, skullduggery and Iranian intrigue. And if I can get my head around it, well, that would be a start. It's an extremely complicated story, but he was democratically elected. He did offend the West by nationalizing Iranian oil, mm. which appealed to the Iranians and not very much to the Brits. The Brits Ooh, were Well, the Brits were paying something like, you know, shilling a gallon or yes, something for yeah, their, yeah. their so, petrol. So, so we had an appallingly good deal. Mm. We had them under our thumb. Uh, so we went bonkers. We got thrown out for plotting against him, but we got the Americans to come in and facilitate a coup, which was probably on the way to happening anyway because of the chaos in the country. And you really don't feel outflanked by the bonkers, which is going on right now. No, I really don't. Come on. I don't feel outflanked. Even I mean, you why, couldn't why... have conceived some of this stuff. But it's not about that, is it? It's about looking at what's happening and deciding where, what's ridiculous about it. It's not about, uh, I mean, at the time we were doing the day to day, the Sunday sport was reporting World War bombers on the moon. <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's never about that. It's about the thrust and it's really about whether, whether the people that you're lancing can get off your spike. And I'm saying that the FBI really cannot get out of the tractor beam of this comedy. I mean, it's true. It's a comedy because it's entertaining. It's a comedy because what happens in real life is a farce. And the conclusion is bound to be serious. But I mean, there are people inside the FBI who agree with this thesis. So hopefully, I mean, look, the FBI spent 18 months winding up a schizophrenic in Boston to come up with a ludicrous plan to fly model airplanes into the dome of the Capitol. The theme at, of the, yeah. At the same time, they said the Tsiarnaev brothers were harmless. Now, that is because, at least in part, it's easier to wind up the mad guy and get him to do something ridiculous and then say, I've saved the city. The trouble was that that effort was taken away from examining what was really happening. So it's kind of, it's a no-brainer. Chris Morris. Thank you for talking to us. All right, thank you.